edition of Scoop Manchester. I'm Liz Brown Swanson here with Erica Brown, the publisher of the Manchester Cricket, who always has the scoop of everything going on in town. So great to have here, <laughs> you here and be together for our first show. Thank you. Things are I'm good. Happy to be here. Yeah, things very, are great. Very exciting. Well, you know, of course, being the publisher of the Cricket, one of Manchester's legendary papers since what, 1888? 1888. It's 132 paper. years in May. And everything you want to know about Manchester is right here in the Cricket. Hot off the press, Erica, she just brought us in. You guys go to print on, thir it comes out on Thursdays, technically. It comes out Thursday mornings. Yeah. So we've got right with us now the December 13th edition that'll be, uh, get, gets mailed out to subscribers. And what's making headlines in Manchester by the Sea this week? Well, this week, I think the, without a doubt, the story is all about Christmas by the Sea which is uh, the, the Cape Ann Chamber of Commerce started it. Um, it's a big sort of annual tradition, years in the making. It's really what turns everyone out to Manchester. Um, at the same time, Essex had its memorial tree lighting and its own sort of uh, holiday festivities, but it was really fantastic. Record turnout in Manchester, it was really, really fantastic. It's been really exciting in downtown Manchester over the holiday season. And in terms of the downtown business, we've got some new businesses there. Yes. Covering them, some new shops opening, and it's just, you feel the energy and the spirit of the holiday, which is so nice. I think it all came together, actually, um, at Christmas by the Sea, because um, there was one end of town, I don't know, you know this. Yes. There's one end of town, sort of this sort of, um, uh, uh, the lower end of Central Street. Right, uh, which had a hall. lot. Yeah, by the town hall, which had a lot of um, empty storefronts for much of the year. In the summertime, that started to change because Antique Table took over the old uh, 7th right. Central spot. And a new restaurant. A new restaurant, and that sort of really gained momentum. And then by Christmas of the Sea, in the two weeks before the Christmas by the Sea festivities, three new places opened up. Right. You know, a bar and restaurant, the mooring, uh, we mm -hmm. had Helen's Bottle Shop, and then Hunt and Gather, which is a pop-up shop. So right. it was really nice. Well, a little bit of everything. The town is waking up. And, you know, for you, this has been an exciting year. You bought this paper, congratulations, one year ago you bought the Manchester Cricket in November I know. and um, you know it's been around since 1888 this is really how we can go back and kind of look at the history of our town and now you're telling the story um, tell everyone out in our community why you decided to buy the Manchester Cricket especially at a time let's face it newspapers are struggling yeah so well tell us your story <laughs> Yes, it's been a year. Um, it's been a very long year. Um, but, <laughs> but you're a journalist, so this is this is you. Well, you are too, yes, and you're yes. from Manchester, so right. you know very well. Um, the Manchester cricket really is a tradition. I honestly don't feel uh, as much as it's been a grind to run it and to sort of shape it and change it over the last year. And I'm trying to do that with a lot of care because um, there's such a long tradition of the paper, and the paper is so loved in town. Um, everybody loves the Manchester cricket. Um, and so it's been a challenge to sort of translate the history into um, what people want today. Um, it's going really well. Um, our subscriptions are up. Our right. paid, paid subscriptions are up 27% in a year. A lot of that is because people are just so enthusiastic about the paper. They really feel like it's their paper. Yes. So You had said that because I talked about the responsibility of really reporting what happens in one's community is on you, but you said, no, the community has so much buy-in. They sort of all, you know, they are giving you stories. They're writing to the paper, of course, with your editorials and things like that. So tell us a little bit about the cricket team, you know, your operation. And I know you're right there on Summer Street. Yep, I'm on 76 Summer Street, the old Texaco station, which is now offices mm -hmm. um, and has been for a while. But yeah, we moved there. The actual cricket building was sold to a business, and so it's been rehabbed, and that was at 50 uh, Summer Street. So we basically have moved up two blocks up the street. Um, but it's, I, I kind of inherited, luckily, uh, Paul Clark, who is our assistant editor, and he still is our assistant editor. He's amazing. He'd been at the paper for quite a while. And, and of course, as we sit here in the beautiful 1623 studios, Paul Clark was on the board yeah. um, here and is certainly incredibly dedicated to the whole Cape Ann community, right? He's well, also he in does. the school system for years. He's a beloved former teacher. He was my daughter's computer teacher. My daughter's in college now. So mm -hmm. I've known Paul for a really long time socially. Um, to work with him has been really a treat. So that's fantastic. Uh, we also have 
Um, Susan Anthony is our subscription manager and our office manager. Mm -hmm. She's also from town, um, right. which is fantastic. Um, and then uh, we have a great digital manager, Christy King, and then Michael Doan just joined us uh, on sort of the business development side, which has been really important. And you mentioned digital because, you know, here we are in a digital age, even though, you know, we've got the newspaper, we want to hold it, touch it. There's something so special about still having to have that paper in your hand. Yeah. But you can go online to yep. the ManchesterCricket.com and read stories and, and be involved there. And, we See, launched. You're we, on Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. Yeah, well, we, we launched. <laughs> you have to. We launched the digital version of the paper in July, and it was a real labor of love. Um, well, I'm not going to say a labor of love. It was it was a labor because we had to figure out what does what should a historic paper feel like when you engage it online. Um, so we launched it in, Jan in July. It's full service. It's fantastic, and it's doing really, really well. Right. So yeah, I mean, good. you're moving forward in, the, in this day and age, but at the same time, the tradition of the paper, like you still have the same masthead, and yep. you've really honored, I think, the many generations of the families that have run this paper, and now it's in your hands, and I love it. It's beautiful to read. We love the color photos. I was thinking about when I was a kid growing up in Manchester, what I went to get to the cricket was to find out what the lunch menu was for the week <laughs> and always to read like the want ads and police notes. And we're going to talk about police notes later on, so you're going to find out what her favorite police note was, but you're going to, this later on in the show. So, you've covered lots of things out there, Erica, and over the past year, I want to know for 2019 your top five stories for Manchester by the Sea this year. You know, what was big? We had a lot of stories this year. It was a really interesting year, to be honest with you. I think when we kicked off the year, I would say there was sort of a school, there was a big school sort of series of stories mm -hmm. um, that kicked off. We started off the year approving both in Manchester and in Essex, and it was an extraordinary vote. Um, the building of a new memorial elementary school in Manchester. Right. Um, and that's actually being uh, built right now, and that is, um, it's in total, technically it's a $50 million project. Our uh, portion of that is $27 million uh, in terms of the two towns um, paying in for that. So that was a really big story. I think also school related, um, since we're on a theme, um, so this doesn't, th this is sort of technically a, a different story, but it's really about school, is the baseball team. The boys baseball <laughs> team this year wow. had a historic first. They won, um, their, they won their state division championship this year, but the story of the team was extraordinary. Um, here are these kids from both Essex and Manchester who have been playing on a Little League team since they were literally six, seven years old. They grow up and here they are in 11th and 12th grade and they finish off their relationship together, mm -hmm. winning this extraordinary thing under a really amazing coach, B.J. Weed. And I think that was a story that everyone just loved. And you captured that. Your photo will share that. That, that picture okay. was extraordinary. Yes. And that picture was a parent's picture. Mm -hmm. Abby Lewandowski took that picture, and it's extraordinary. We are all reporters out there with our smartphones, right? And yeah. can do all of that. So that would be big on education. What else was you know, really hard hitting in terms of what was important in Manchester that you covered? I think um, a story that I think is a really big one, it's much bigger than Manchester but it's, and Essex, but it's really kind of starting here in our area that has been extraordinary is this idea of shared services and collaboration between municipalities to kind of um, share the burden of costs. And I think if it seems to be something that's coming out of the state house or out of um, you know the governor's office, where they're really trying to encourage towns to find areas of redundancy so that they can work together and pony up together, either right. on things that are as small as like accounting software. We're, who cares? You know, let's do it together, or RFPing something together. But then it can also impact really bigger things, like um, services where one town might be a little weaker and one town might be a little stronger poning up together, maybe in um, waste disposal, things like that. Right, I know we've talked about like Manchester, Essex also, which you do a great job bringing Essex into this paper, right, with the Essex Echo, Echo I, and really If you were to look at the newspapers, about both towns. if you were to look at the newspapers, the Manchester Cricket in the 1920s, the masthead read the Manchester Cricket and the Essex Echo. Oh, wow. Oh, I, no, yes, it was a major part these towns have a past connection right. to each other, it, and it's it's. I'm just bringing that back. Yes, and with the school district regionalized, but you're and we're referencing like even more than Manchester and Essex, it would be Gloucester. You were talking about like the idea of the dredging projects and things. That like was that, another big. I mean, the coastline things like that. I would call that the mother load of shared services because <laughs> it was something. It, it seems to have been the brainchild of Bruce Tarr, um, and what 
there is this sort of need, this shared problem and challenge of coastal fortification. That's really what it is mm -hmm. about. In a world of global warming and rising sea levels, what are coastal towns like Manchester, like Essex, like Gloucester, and then all the way up to Salisbury, how are they going to sort of use every tool in their tool chest to sort of combat it? And this um, effort is called the Northeast Coastal Coalition. It was launched in July. It actually happened a little before that, but the first big meeting was in Essex in July. And you and covered it had, that? Or did I you covered that, on and that? it was every, I mean, it was an amazing turnout of municipal leaders, um, federal uh, engineers, uh, academia, everything. And there's a $50 million um, assessment, or it's not an assessment, uh, funding that uh, Bruce Tarr has navigated through um, and uh, got approved that will be for coastal resiliency and dredging if we choose to collaborate with other towns as part of this Northeast Coastal Coalition. It's actually very exciting. It's going to take years to work out, but it will be really interesting. And you're going to scoop the story as it evolves in 2020, right? I definitely <laughs> will. <laughs> so moving on, so we've got a few. Any others you want to mention in terms of the, you know, your top picks in terms of what were really impactful? Um, Impactful stories? Yeah, like the, you know, the biggest things. And then I want to move on to your favorite story. Okay. Your favorite story was of 2019. I think, I mean, I think impactful stories, I think shared services is going to, we're going to see a lot of that over the next 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, I think that will play out in terms of um, things like um, uh, trash pickup, uh, you know, DPW initiatives, things like that. Um, I think dredging will be a part of that. Um, I think that. Uh, just looking for ways to save money, and I think affordable housing is going to be a big issue for next year. Yeah, and and reflecting back though more on to what you saw is big in the paper. I was really referring to this past year. Like I know that Manchester got a new dock in town, things like that. Oh yeah, Morse Pier. Yeah, Morse Pier came online. That was also an, uh, the result of a um, a grant from the state, mm -hmm. and we had essentially four hundred thousand dollars, give or take. I think it's a little less um, that came from. Uh, Governor Baker's office to rebuild the pier for commercial services in Manchester, and it was really a big deal. And it's been a great move for the merchants downtown. I know that because you're bringing more boaters in, and they're shopping in town. I witnessed it this summer. That was part of it, but then another part of it is the very real commercial fishing that right. we have, and and shell fishing that we have in Manchester, and it's a really important thing. And it's all the result of. Um, these grants are now going to smaller ports uh, and smaller harbors, as opposed to in, traditionally these big grants from the state um, go to New Bedford or these big places, and now they're coming to places like Manchester. Yeah. Manchester's where it's at. That's because we live there. <laughs> We're village girls. We live right downtown Manchester. We do, both of us. <laughs> there you go. All right, you tell us what your favorite story was in 2019 that you got to cover. Uh, my favorite story. Um, Actually, it would be a little lighter uh, okay. than, than dredging or People these like things. People like We're in the yeah. holiday time. I mean, it's definitely the Manchester Crickets Fair. So my favorite story, I have to say, there, were, there are actually two of them, you if you to, don't mind. Okay, well, okay, we'll give you two. Okay. We've got time. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're pretty short. The, okay. the first one, I thought, was just a fun favorite one. It was kind of this David and Goliath type story. Um, we got a call from a resident who is a, she's actually uh, a business professor at Salem State University, but she, um, she's, a thes you know, she's an actor. She, right. She's been acting for years and years and is rather good at it. And she was participating in this ensemble sort of uh, limited uh, run play of To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm -hmm. it was, and it was, had these great directors, everything was gonna happen in Marblehead. They had been prepping and prepping and prepping. And literally 48 hours before the show was supposed to take off, um, they got a cease and desist letter no. from, yeah, from some big uh, wow. law firm in New York oh my City. God, that's <laughs> devastating. Okay. The show won't go on. The show won't go on, exactly. That's the the show will not go on. Um, but in any case, what happened was they had run afoul of some licensing uh, deal. There was a, 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 a troop. Yeah, exactly. There was a troop in, in Boston that had the rights to it, and they were within 30 miles of the Boston radius, and so they, they literally got this on a Wednesday. They were supposed to open on a Friday. And these are people who just love this play. And so she was playing Miss Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> so the story was that the Gloucester Stage Company came to the rescue. Of they course, literally the called Gloucester. them up, and, <laughs> and they said, they won't have you, we'll have you. We're outside of that 30 mile radius. Two weeks later, the play went on. And by the way, we covered it. It was also covered in the New York Times. The That's same. incredible. Yeah. That is big yeah. time. I like yeah. that. So you, have, you can share another favorite. Okay, that's thank you. That's a good story. Um, another Warm one th that's very Manchester is the Manchester Club. We ran a story about the history of the Manchester Club, 104 years old. Yeah, my it's dad was a member. My brother was a member. 
brothers and women. I and think so that the, what really makes the Manchester Club, it's a men's only club. It's essentially a monthly mm -hmm. dinner club. And they cook dinner for each other. And what's lovely about it, it's 104 years old, it's got a great history, and it really brings together every the full spectrum of our residents. You know, you can be <laughs> the rich and fancy wasp, you could be the regular guy, the regular right. Joe. They all come together at the Manchester Club and they've become incredibly competitive and it's almost like a sport to watch with their cooking skills in the kitchen cooking for each other. So they try to outdo each other with their meals. And we featured the Mort Mayo uh, fish dinner, which is traditionally served every March and it has been served every year since like 1972 in right. March at the Manchester Club and, it, and that was a favorite. And the thing is, I've been I've been behind the scenes at some of those dinners because my husband's also a member. And like when I go through to like put together a gourmet dinner party, these guys though seem to do it effortlessly and they just feed a whole room full of guys, you know, and they're all and so I, happy. I want to say the ticket is I want to say the ticket is like ten dollars. Yes, it's something bad. And yes, we ran the Mort Mayo fish recipe and for the first time ever, and it, the cook Todd. Uh, Todd Crane said, you know, was, was caught a lot of heat for that. Right, and I think you also, did you also put in the pot roast recipe in another yes. story? The Ken and so, Davis. by the way, if we're making our viewers hungry, if they want to look at any recipes that appear in the Manchester Cricket, is there a way to navigate yeah. online to get those? Yeah. Easy? Yeah. Easy. Right. Just very, look very at fun. recipe. I have to also pitch recipes because you profiled one of my friends from Essex, Brenda King, who you called her the starter queen. You yes. know, all her fun apps for the holidays. Appetizers. And so people are going to want to check out. Those were, those were fabulous. So yeah. I like your favorite stories. How about, you know, as we look through your paper, it's very, the structure of it, you always have police notes. Yes. So I want to know what your funniest police note was. All right, well, for context. <laughs> For context, the Manchester Cricket is known for its police notes because its police notes historically have been the police notes of a small town. That they can be innocuous, they can be a little funny, they can feel a little harmless. The truth is, there's a lot of serious business that is done by the police department in town. Like dealing with break-ins and things like that. But the police that. notes really are representative of people who call in and they can be very funny and we run them. So. Um, I asked Paul Clark who, about which ones are his favorites because he likes to watch them. And our favorite one that we came up with came out a little over a year ago. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, a call in from a resident on School Street. And it was man walking down School Street naked from the waist, <laughs> naked from the waist down. No. Naked from the waist down. That photo wasn't in the paper. It wasn't in the paper, but here's the, here's the kicker. The police respond because, of course, they have to. Yes. You know what? He was wearing khakis. And they, look, that is hysterical. <laughs> Those people did not have on their glasses, or they need to get their he eyes. He was wearing checked. khakis. That's funny. I happen to I just naked from the waist down. I think a week ago I was reading police notes, and it said deceased skunk in the middle of the road yeah, was go. called in. And then you told me a funny one about a comb. They get them and they go on, but they are serious. Masconomo Street. A woman called in because there was a comb on Masconomo Street. And I have to take this, this, make this segue now because we didn't mention it earlier as an important event in our town, and that is we have now officially a new police chief that's been there for a long time. I would say, say that's that. one of the. Um, we had kind of Todd a theme of change. Uh, the police chief we had in a, uh, some important changing of the guards this year, right? And he's probably at the top of the list. I mean, Todd Fitzgerald from Manchester grew up in Manchester. He's a total local. And it took him a while for them to give him that position. His grandfather was a member of the police department, if you remember that. Mm -hmm. So he has really deep roots in the police department. Yep. He became a policeman. He actually um, mentored when he first started Paul Francis, who is now the police chief over in Essex. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, they worked together in the 90s. So he works his entire career here. Um, there is a uh, police chief retires a couple years ago. He goes for the job. He doesn't get it. It goes to Ed Connolly, who's now up in Manchester. Um, and that was, he said in a public meeting, it was a really hard time for him to kind of deal with that. Um, in all fairness, the, 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 at the time, the consensus w among sort of the town officials was they didn't want somebody local yeah, being at the I head. Yeah, I see that happen. And yeah. so they wanted to go outside. And now here we are two years later, and he was finally sworn in. Right. To a job that Ed Connolly said he'd been doing for the last couple of years. Right. So and congratulations so again to Todd yeah. Fitzgerald. And then I family. also, in terms of changing the guard, I, I, um, Susan Beckman right. uh, kind of retired. 
on the Board of Selectmen. Board of Selectmen, she's a long time, really important part of the Board of Selectmen. She ushered in uh, regionalization 20 years ago mm -hmm. as, as a she member, is, chairman of the school committee. She has she's done. She's a force. She she's is a, a force. force. Yeah. And I think we haven't seen the last of her. Right. And by the way, you can find out every week what's going on with the Board of Selectmen. You have a wonderful section every week, which Page you have three. the town administrator gives you everything that's sort of going on in the community. And it's a great way to find out factually what's happening versus sort of the emotion that can happen when issues are coming into town. And everybody's on Facebook now and what's happening and kind of sort of the, the reason a dialogue about The reason the cricket on. has a role and is really loved is because you cannot get what's happening on town boards and all these important things from Facebook or from Google. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, more importantly, people don't want to get those things from Facebook or Google. Right. They want to have a local paper that is theirs. And whether that's the Gloucester Times or the Manchester Cricket, mm -hmm. it's a really, really in indispensable part of community life. Yes, you got a lot of letters from the editor. I'm sure. I on do. Any, every topic. Um, and I'm curious what story in 2019 brought you the most letters to the editor? What would that be? <laughs> if you think of that. Um, I'd have to say it was in the springtime. We had a really long stretch of time that was, I would call, the eelgrass season. Oh, yeah. The eelgrass controversy season. Um, and really, what it was about, it was, it was about um, this sort of um, increasing popularity of boats parking um, their boats Dollar for the Cove day area in Manchester. on Long Beach, off Long Beach I've and been on Sand Dollar Cove. Cove. <laughs> and it's, it's essentially the beginning of the Outer Harbor. Um, and there was this kind of movement to protect what's called eelgrass. Now eelgrass, in all fairness, is incredibly important. Um, it's extremely um, and profoundly productive with um, absorbing CO2. In the, in the ocean, so they want to protect it, and that's fine. But really, this was a controversy about those boats and about them threatening eelgrass, and there was a whole series about that. And I have to say, Bayon Pike, our harbor master, He's fabulous. he did an extraordinary job kind of navigating this and pacing out public hearings in a way that everyone <clears throat> was heard, and they also wrote in quite a lot. And the reality of that story, I know as someone that's grown up in town, was in that particular area, which was a very affluent area of town where the homes are big homes overlooking this harbor. I think that tends that the boaters that were going there were locals and felt this was like against the townies, as you call them. Yeah. Just sort of like they just didn't want to see this blight in their backyard. But it, it was an environmental edge. And so this is yeah. going to continue the story. It's You're saying there's going to be more to it? I think what they'll do is they'll parse out the issue for what it is. I mean, it was really clear that eelgrass, we had environmentalists who said, listen, eelgrasses are not being threatened right. um, in this way. So then you are left with the issue of congestion um, of increased popularity. And now, voter safety. And voter safety I mean, I, is it part of it. Um, I think, I mean, the truth is, there have been families that have been going out on beautiful Sundays for generations to that place. And the truth is that, um, you know, it's not a lot of days in the year. It's an inconvenience that happens on beautiful days right. in the summer. A handful. And really, it's a handful at the end of the yes. day. Yes. All right, well, we'll stay tuned for that. Um, talk about your favorite pictures. I mean, you have this, oh. you have, there's so many beautiful, I'm just looking even today, I love to see uh, your neighbor Colleen from Manchester that owns uh, Chapman. She's yep. on the front page, a nice photo of her and her yeah. and over at Chapman's and just to see the center of town. And how about your favorite pics? I have some, I mean, um, I have a incredible- Your pics of your pics. <laughs> I think some of the pics. We've <laughs> had some really fantastic, my favorite of the year has to be um, what I call Maisie at the Helm. I love which, that photo. Um, it's, it's Woody Kelly, uh, he's a fixture in town as well, it's his dog, and we were going out on the boat, and I happened to take that shot, and it was a shot of Maisie, his boat, which, I mean his dog, who literally almost has Velcro paws at like <laughs> the top of the thing, turning around as if to order, you know, right. you know, Woody, where to go. Yeah, that is really that was a good hilarious, one. but that one's pick? a good one. Um, I love the pictures from the Manchester Club, um, the, the, the men cooking. Mm -hmm. I just thought that was just so sweet. And that was actually, those were shot um, by a local photographer. It was fantastic. Um, I think that the shots taken by Paul Clark of sports and of, it has, have been extraordinary this year. I mean, it's very, very hard to take good sports sports photography, yes. um, and he's just amazing at it. And not to mention, to plug my own family member, Paul Crean, who caught the big oh. tuna 
That was like, how can you not pick that one? All right, earlier you talked <laughs> We're about- We're in Gloucester, we have to pick earlier you, story. Earlier you talked about smartphones and about how yeah, everyone, everyone can be a can reporter. Be, yes. That photograph, which was the front page of the paper, is an extraordinary photograph. It's gorgeous. I know, it's like looking down, it's quite the angle. It was taken 20 miles offshore with a Samsung phone. Love it. Like, it's extraordinary. I know, we were saying earlier, both Eric and I have been reporters for many years. We worked in New Hampshire together covering the presidential primary of we 1988. Did. We don't want to date ourselves. I was working at <laughs> Channel 9 and you were doing print and, and all of that. And to carry around those big, yeah. heavy cameras, you know, I literally didn't, if I didn't go, I mean, I had to schlep the big decks. And now, you know, I've done stories with my iPhone and they look beautiful. So we're all out there being reporters. Yes. And, um, and maybe at this, for this minute, just can you share a little bit more of your background, like just your, just being a journalist and all that and how you bring that. And you have, you know, you were in PR and all that and how yeah. this all helps you do what you do every day. Well, I, <laughs> I laugh and I say I'm perfect for the Manchester cricket because I'm the perfect package. <laughs> I started off my career as a, an, a writer, uh -huh. a, a reporter for the Salem Evening News. Yes. Then I went up to the Portsmouth Herald. I worked for daily newspapers. Then I started freelancing. I wrote for magazines and, and mm -hmm. wire services. And then I landed at um, Mullen Advertising in Wenham, mm -hmm. um, so, which is a, a common thing for reporters to go over to PR, which is what I did. Uh, and then from there, I went into branding. I started an agency, so I've got advertising. Better. So for a newspaper, you Perfect need that. And, and I'm married to a townie, so there and you go. Yeah, it happens to be my cousin, that townie. Yeah. Restaurant. And I'm gonna, we're going to have to start wrapping it up. You are with that townie, your husband, at the Council of Aging, because every holiday he yeah. feeds the Council of Aging a wonderful meal. We're going to share some of the photos and highlights. Was that a fun night with the locals in downtown Manchester? They do it every year since 2002, and it's the Manchester Masons. They, uh, they host all of the seniors in town for a holiday meal yeah, it was lovely well, i bet it was great all right now last minute you know as we kind of wrap it up here on scoop manchester we're going to be doing this a lot i hope where you can kind of bring us up to speed and give us the scoop um i'm just curious what you think will probably be the big story of 2020. i think without a town i think without a doubt it's going to be the 375th uh celebration because, that's right yeah um that's a big deal it is really interesting with that it seems like cape ann is going into like milestone season mm -hmm. because Essex just finished its year of its bicentennial, which okay. was extraordinary. Next year is our 375th. Gloucester's going to have its 400th in four wow. years, but still, they're planning for it now. But we're going to have- We're a baby um, then compared 20, to Gloucester. No, <laughs> okay, 375 then. is right not bad. Um, we're we're going to have 25 events this year, and it starts off in January with a big Christmas tree bonfire. It'll be spectacular yes. at- um, it'll be at the Manchester Athletic Club. And not to make controversy about a bonfire, but you got a few letters to the editor about people being concerned about burning the tree and let's do composting, but it's happening. It's happening it, and it- It'll it, be a fun celebration. Yeah. In fact, I'm gonna take this opportunity to pitch the 2020 Manchester by the Sea calendar put together by the 375th committee. This is all for them to help them do the events for the community, you know, for all of Cape Ann to come on down and celebrate in town. And inside it too, you'll see a list of, there's a lot of events happening. A lot of events, they're fantastic. There's something for everyone. Yeah, and, the and you'll images, be covering them all. The image, I'll be covering them all. The images are gorgeous and they're all from the Manchester Historical Museum. They're beautiful. All right, well, let's we kind of wrap it up here on Scoop of Manchester. Anything else you want to add? And it's been fun no. with you and happy holidays. It's happy it's holidays to you too. This was fantastic. Thank you. All right, that'll do it for this first edition of Scoop Manchester. I'm Liz Brown Swanson here with Erica Brown from the Manchester Cricket. Enjoy. Happy holidays, everyone.